Hello and welcome to the launch. Recording in progress. Hello and welcome to the launch of our 2021 transition report, System Upgrade Delivering the Digital Dividend. This event is organized by the Office of the Chief Economist here at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I am Beata Jaworczyk. I am EBRD's Chief Economist. Crises often fast forward innovation and the COVID crisis has been no exception in this respect. We've embraced the digital world in, in a new way, in new ways and at a speed which would have been hard to imagine before. And digitalization will remain one of the most powerful forces shaping our world and in the EBRD regions. Therefore, it's very fitting that digitalization is the theme of this year's transition report. What does digitalization mean for the countries where the EBRD operates? What does it mean for firms, for banks, for workers? These are the issues that we will be discussing with our guest speakers. And I'm very happy to introduce the great lineup of uh, panelists we have today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Thomas Hendrik Ilves, former president of Estonia, Daron Asemoglu, MIT Institute Professor of Economics, Dina Mata, EBRD Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer, and last but not least, Oleksandr Borniakov, Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. A warm welcome to all of you. EBRD president uh, Odile Renaud Basson will also share with us some of her opening remarks. A few housekeeping rules. This event is being streamed on the EBRD YouTube Live as well as via Zoom. If you are watching us on YouTube Live, please post your comments into the chat section below the video. If you are joining us on Zoom, please make sure that you mute yourself and you keep your video off. You can put questions in the chat and please introduce yourself when you do so. We will be taking your questions towards the end of the broadcast. So let's start. Our president, Odile Renaud Basson, will deliver the opening remarks for this important discussion. Good afternoon. Making a success of the shift to digital will be vital if we are to achieve the world's sustainable development goals. This is true of our economies, society as a whole, and the environment. Now, COVID-19 has only underlined the way digital can benefit the three Ps of people, the planet, and prosperity. People, because digital technologies have helped us all in the fields of employment, health, and education. The planet, because they enhance sustainability and prosperity because they strengthen businesses' resilience. Now that we are moving beyond the period of response to the pandemic, such technologies have enormous potential to ensure that the recovery from it is strong and inclusive, as well as sustainable and resilient. We all need to keep up with the radical changes brought about by digital technologies not least because alongside the many benefits they bring, they also confront us with challenges. Businesses and those working for them have to adapt, and we have to bridge the digital divide to avoid social exclusion. Many EBRD countries risk failing to make the most of digital and therefore falling further behind more advanced economies. And this is one of the reasons we have made digital a strategic priority over the next few years. But before we invest in digital and work on our digital policy in our regions, we need to understand it properly. Our new transition report helps us just do that. Its title, System Upgrade, highlights digital technology's potential to accelerate systemic change. It is an excellent read and I look forward to the discussion its ideas will provoke from our panel today. Thank you. Many thanks to Odile for these words of encouragement and support. And now let me share with you some of the highlights of the report. 
Um, the report is very rich in content, so I'm certainly not going to justice to it in the sh short presentation, but I hope that the findings I will highlight here will encourage you to read at least parts of the report. Now, the first part of the report documents the large digital divide that is present between countries as well as within societies. Now, there are many ways of measuring digital divide. One of them is to look at the number of broadband subscriptions, which give access to fast internet, um, per 100 individuals. And as you can see in this map, um, there is quite a lot of heterogeneity across countries, with many of EBRD countries lagging behind Western Europe. I could show you a similar map that depicts 4G mobile data access, and the conclusions would be quite similar. But of course, you may prefer a more comprehensive index, and we have prepared such index um, for the report. It encompasses 22 various indicators ranging from infrastructure, availability, skills, regulation, e-government, as well as the extent to which firms and consumers have embraced digitalization. And again, enormous differences across EBRD regions are visible. At the one end of the spectrum, we have Estonia, whose digital sophistication exceeds that of many advanced economies. At the other end of the spectrum, there is Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, West Bank, and Egypt, all of which have the values of the index below that found in India. Another way of capturing digitalization is to look at prevalence online, of online shopping. Um, in this diagram, you can see that in most countries, People have embraced internet shopping during the pandemic. Most of the little dots and diamonds lie above 45 degree line. But enormous differences remain. In the United Kingdom, 90% of people, so almost everyone, purchased something online last year. The same is true in many Nordic countries and Western Europe. If you look at emerging Europe, the new EU member states, there it's between half and two thirds of people uh, who've purchased something online. In Western Balkans and in Bulgaria, the situation is quite different. The share of individuals who shop online is below a third and it's uh, close to one fifth in some countries. We were interested in what drives these low figures um, for Semet countries for Western Balkans. So we dug into this issue further and a somewhat surprising conclusion emerged. It is not concerns about payment security that drive low prevalence of online shopping, but rather it is the lack of skills that prevents from people uh, from embracing this digital opportunity. And the lack of skills uh, is very visible if you zoom in on the situation within countries. So for instance, the likelihood of engaging in online shopping increases with your income level. Now, this is true in advanced Europe, but this is also or particularly true in emerging Europe. And the relationship between income level and the probability of online shopping is much steeper for emerging economies. A similar relationship is observed about between levels of education and the likelihood of online shopping. Again, um, this is also true of Western Europe, but this relationship is much more pronounced in emerging Europe and in particularly in Western Balkans and Turkey. But perhaps what's more striking is the difference observed among older people. So people between the ages of 55 and 74. In advanced Europe, more than two thirds of those people um, shop online. In 
EU, Eastern European uh, EU countries, that's less than a third. And in Western Balkans, it's only 15%. And this is a reflection of low digital skills among older workers. Um, this pattern has already been documented using, for instance, PISA test of adult skills. And it's particularly disconcerting because many of these countries are experiencing adverse demographic trends. So there is a possibility that progress in digitalization will make it difficult for older workers to continue working. In the report, we also look at teleworking, at artificial intelligence, and the implication for employment and the structure of the economy. Um, the impact of digitalization on structural changes is already quite visible in most of the countries where the EBRD is active. In particular, we've seen that over the last decade, digitally intensive sectors have registered much faster employment growth than other sectors. And in sectors which are low in digital intensity, in many cases, employment remained stagnant or even shrunk. So already digitalization is changing the structure of many economies. But this process is going to be hampered by digital brain drain. And here we use quite interesting data, data from LinkedIn job networking website, where we are able to observe people's skills as well as people's location and movement between location. And what you can see very clearly is that advanced economies are importing workers, in particular workers with disruptive tech skills and tech skills in general. While EBRD regions serve as export countries, they are exporting workers, um, they are experiencing digital brain drain, and this brain drain is particularly pronounced when it comes to disruptive tech skills. Now, let me move towards uh, to latest development, working from home during the pandemic. Um, countries where the EBRD operates have embraced working from home, just like Western European countries did. Interestingly, uh, our survey data show that workers in EBRD countries feel equally productive working from home as working in the office, um, as, and this pattern is quite similar to what has been reported by workers in Western Europe. Um, it's very encouraging because workers in EBRD regions are more likely to experience disruptions uh, in their internet access. Another pattern we document in the report shows that working from home tends to be much more prevalent in regions where interpersonal trust is greater. And that's even after you control for the regional level of income. So perhaps it is no surprise that there is a gap in expectations when it comes to working from home after the pandemic. Employees are very enthusiastic about working from home. This is true in EBRD regions as well as in developed countries but their employers are much less so. So there is this big gap between expectations and preferences of employees and employers when it comes to their perceptions of working from home. And perhaps in EBRD regions, this is somewhat related to the low level of interpersonal trust. Now let's spend a minute thinking about future trends. What the future is likely to bring is artificial intelligence fueled automation. And it's quite striking that the EBRD regions seem to be exposed to potential AI automation to the same extent as advanced economies. Now, this exposure is measured based on occupational structure. 
And it's not that EBRD regions have the same occupational structure as advanced economies, but rather that occupations that are popular there rely on the same types of tasks, tasks that lend themselves easily to automation. We also look at the report at what digitalization or availability of digital infrastructure means for firms' performance. Um, and in particular, we do two case studies. We look at Turkey, where the government rolled out fiber internet, which gave firms access to fast, um, which gave firms fast internet access. And here we expected that access to internet will lower the cost of obtaining information about other markets, including foreign markets. And that's going to be particularly important for smaller firms, which have fewer funds uh, for this purpose, which are less willing to invest funds in gathering information. And that's indeed turned out to be true. As orange bars indicate here, small manufacturing firms in Turkey, which benefited from access to fast broadband, to fast internet, were more likely to increase exports, to increase number of exported products or number of exported products and destinations than, fir than firms that did not have access to fast internet. In the context of Russia, we looked at the rollout of 4G mobile data access. The red dots in this map show where such access was available in Moscow in 2013, the green dots depict active firms. By having very detailed information on which locations were able to have access to 4G data, we were able to compare firms often located in the same neighborhood of Moscow, firms that differed because one of them had access to, inter to 4G data, while the other one did not because of the location of uh, mobile towers. And what we observed was that small firms, especially micro firms in services industries that had access to 4G mobile data, increased employment. They were able to leverage 4G rollout and translate it into faster growth. We also show in the report that they were more likely to engage in innovation. Finally, let me come to banking sector and fintech. Our survey of bank CEOs showed that almost half of them view automation as the key strategic concern that's going to shape their activity over the coming years. And that's not surprising because technological disruption has already started to transform financial services. China is a leader in this respect. Um, if you look at peer-to-peer -peer lending intermediated through FinTech, um, it amounts to 1.2% of Chinese GDP. For comparison, it's only 0.2% in the UK and half that much in the United States. But many of our countries of operations are global leaders when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer lending. Among them are Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, as well as Baltic states. And the pattern here is quite interesting because on the one hand, you see countries with highly developed financial markets developing FinTech. On the other hand, countries with, with underdeveloped financial markets are also embracing fintechs. In the latter group, this non-traditional financial sector is a substitute for a more traditional banking sector. If you look at the relationship between GDP per capita and access to alternative finance in per capita terms, there is a positive relationship as you would expect, but many of our countries, these are the, the red dots, um, have much more developed fintech sectors than what you would expect given their level of income. And the Baltic states are in particularly uh, stand out in this respect. But 
What's also striking is that in our countries of operations, the fintech sector is biased towards debt and equity um, lending is much less developed in our countries of operation. Why, for instance, in the United Kingdom, there is quite a bit of balance. There is almost perfect balance between debt and equity when it comes to fintech. So to summarize, the few of the findings I presented to you, there are large differences between our regions and advanced countries when it comes to digital sophistication. There are large differences across EBRD regions as well as within countries. And these differences stem from differences in the development of infrastructure as well as digital skills. Digitalization has already made a mark on the structure of economies, transforming the employment structure. It has also helped SMEs by lowering costs of obtaining information. More disruption is to come, in particular through exposure to AI automation. Finally, fintech sector has grown significantly and it has been quite developed both in economies with sophisticated financial markets as well as those where financial markets remain underdeveloped. But in the EBRD regions, the fintech sector is biased towards the debt. So these were just a few highlights from the report. Now I would like to invite our panelists to share their thoughts and reactions on the broad the defined topic of digitalization. So Thomas, if I may start with you, please keep the remarks short. Let's stick to four minutes in the initial round of interventions. Sure, uh, let, me, let me do this very quickly and set my timer so I don't go over. But let me just say this, that um, well, you had there Estonia as the top country in the EBRD region in digitization of uh, government services, but actually according to DESI, which is the EU only uh, ranking, we're also number one. So we're ahead of everyone in Europe in digitization. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, I, a picture of what the difference is, is that uh, when I, I read last year in uh, May, uh, June, uh, of how there was a backlog of passport applications of uh, three and a half million in the people in the United States because of COVID, because all the government offices were closed. We had no back, uh, we had no backlog whatsoever. Moreover, I mean, basically our government services were in no way affected by, uh, by COVID. I mean, other things clearly were, but government services simply continued because basically all services in Estonia are, digit, are online except for three, which is basically getting married, number two, getting divorced, and number three, which is buying, uh, buying uh, real, real estate or, or selling real estate, either one transfers a physical property. Now, I don't wanna get into that, I mean, uh, too much. I, it's rather that, what I would say is that I think that this country has at this point reached the ceiling. It's as far as it can go in terms of digitization, of public services. I mean, there are always little tweaks you can do and we're bringing in AI to do where the government comes and decides, I mean, comes in and approaches you on issues, be they healthcare or, or uh, taxes or something. But the, what I really wanna say is that what we need is uh, right now, and really the task before us is to get an integration across you, at least the EU and perhaps beyond. That is that Right now, the interoperability of services is at a horrible level. Um, there's only one cross-border service anywhere in the world, and that is, that's for digital prescriptions that operate between Estonia and Finland. That, that is the only digital service anywhere that you can do an Estonian citizen in Finland or vice versa, Finn in Estonia can access his uh, his um, <clears throat> prescription. This requires a major legislative effort across Europe and the region in order to make these services available so that if an Estonian goes to Paris he, and he gets sick, he can get his, his medicine there. 
same if I if I go to Greece and get sick, I go to a doctor, I authorize him to look at my medical records, he gets all my medical records and already in Greek because he obviously is not going to know Estonia. I mean, these are examples of the, where we need to be going in order to, in the 21st century, because right now everything is, is basically isolated. Now, what I would basically say that what you need in order to accomplish this are three basic pillars. You, every country needs to have a, a unique, every person in a country needs to have a unique and secure digital identity. Without that digitization, will not proceed, at least in any kind of public, public sector. That's the first thing. Second thing, you need to have a distributed architecture, which is what enables, which is what gives you a huge amount of security and so forth. And third, what you need is to protect data integrity because we're all upset with privacy, but the real issue is that not whether someone can see your data, but whether someone can change your data. So these are the challenges ahead, and these are the things I believe that the EBRD should be focusing on in raising the level of government and public services in the digital sphere. And that's now my time is up. So that's I can continue later. Thank you very much. It's great to say um, to set ambitious goal goals and to give us as an institution some hints about what we should be doing and what kind of initiatives we should be supporting. Um, Daron, now over to you. Thank you, Beata. I'm first of all delighted to be here and delighted to see that EBRD is taking on the effects of digital technologies on its member countries and the world more generally. You know, unless you have been under a uh, rock in a deep cave, of course, you know that digital technologies have transformed pretty much every economy in the world. You know, today we are at a crossroads in terms of another explosion in the expansion of the reach of digital technologies with uh, AI and more data intensive uses. And it is also pretty hard not to be overwhelmed by the enthusiasm that comes from every corner of uh, the Atlantic, uh, both in the US and Europe about digital technologies. But I think we should be a little bit more circumspect about it. First of all, digital technologies have indeed led to an explosion of new products and innovations. If you look at US data, the number of patents have increased by fourfold since 1980, and that's led by electronics and computers. Same in Europe. But if you look at other measures, we are going through one of the slowest periods of economic growth anywhere in the Western world. We are experiencing some of the worst outcomes in terms of inequality, and it's not just in the United States. Inequality is a huge problem in every advanced economy, and some of them, it shows up more in employment, some of them more in wages, but middle-class jobs are disappearing and low education workers are suffering in most Western countries. And these are not separable from digital technologies. I think there are several aspects of digital technologies that are creating an environment in which only some workers, some segments of society are benefiting. And my concern is that the future is going to deepen these divides. This is definitely true from robotics to office-based software automation. But now with data being collected in the hands of a handful of companies who have excessive amount of power over citizens, over consumers, over their business rivals, I think we have to evaluate the effects of digital technologies much more holistically. So even if you look at something like FinTech, which of course, I think it's an amazingly promising technology because it promises to bring finance and credit to underbanked and undersupplied individuals in many places, including the United States. Part of its lifeblood is data, but that control of data that FinTech now has might soon develop into the same type of control of data that Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and other companies like that have as well. So I think any discussion of digital technologies in my mind would be amiss if it did not 
talk about the following three items. One, why is it that adoption of digital technologies have been associated with so much inequality pretty much everywhere? Second, why is it that despite all of the enthusiasm from Silicon Valley to everywhere else, we are not seeing the benefits of digital technologies? In what way are we misusing them? I'm not denying that these are promising technologies, but if they are promising and we're not getting the fruits, that must be that we are misusing it. Either companies are misusing it, governments are misusing it, or there's something else that creates these problems. And third, you know, how we're gonna regulate these technologies, how we're gonna regulate data. I think the sort of uh, conceit that somehow Google knows best or the market's going to sort it out is not just wrong, it's fairly dangerous in our 21st century turning point. And I hope that we move away from it and we really start thinking about a science and evidence-based framework for regulation of technology and big tech companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren, for these very sobering remarks. Um, I think it will be nice for Thomas and Darren perhaps continue the discussion while showing both sides, the, the good side, the, the promising side, as well as the side we should be more circumstant about as we continue with this discussion. Now, perhaps Dina would like to share a bit more of a private sector perspective. Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beata, and uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, have worked with companies in about five different sectors uh, across Europe and the US, um, really focused on uh, how do we bring adopt technologies, how do we bring technologies to life, not only inside the companies, but for our customers. And uh, during this journey, uh, I have seen um, the challenges close up at uh, what this means, not only uh, inside companies, but also impacting uh, our, our ecosystems in terms of uh, customers, suppliers, and so on. Um, the holy grail for me has been adoption. Uh, and not the technologies themselves. We talk about AI and robotics. These have been uh, emerged in the 80s many, many years ago. Uh, but it's the adoption of these technologies and the issues they raise that have been at the forefront of the work that I've been trying to do. More recently, of course, data has been the, 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 the mantra. Uh, but this also brings about huge ethical questions, um, which also impact what we can what we are able to do and the impact we have on the societies in which we operate. Um, just to conclude a little bit, uh, I've seen also a, a shift from producers, whereas uh, we started off on many of these digitalization journeys for the benefit of firms, uh, shifts somewhat with the mobile, uh, the, the third generation of uh, technology to consumers, uh, but against the background of uh, the companies that uh, Diane mentioned, the big techs who increasingly uh, play a dominant role, uh, much more so than uh, any one company can do. And the interoperability or lack of it has meant that uh, digitalization dividend has been minimum because it's always been constrained by the boundaries of the firm itself. And it's only, and why companies like Google and Amazon have been able to get a much bigger proportion of this dividend is because they have been able to go across. Uh, but it's a handful of companies and there's um, much more to do in this area. I'll pause here and uh, look forward to the questions, Beata. Thank you, Dina. So while Darren pointed out the adverse or unequal impact on workers, you pointed out unequal impact on firms with the big tech on the one hand and other firms on the other. So it would be nice to come back uh, to this issue later on. Um, so Alexandre, now you are trying to stimulate or fast forward digitalization in Ukraine, how is it going? What do things look like from your perspective? 
Yeah, well, thank, first of all, thank you for this comprehensive research and it's really useful to hear things. Um, and the major thing that just touched me uh, that about um, lack of, uh, you know, th those are, uh, there's a definitely lack of skills uh, then rather than lack of access. So the same will as emerging countries, I represent Ukraine, we feel the same here because uh, uh, in terms of digitalization, we made a lot of uh, bold steps ahead. So we, we uh, introduced digital passports in first in the world. We made them equal to the paper ones. We came up with the DA application with all the paperwork. Uh, I mean, papers uh, inside like driver license, uh, car insurance, car titles, uh, birth certificates, COVID certificates. And by the way, just a reflection of what Thomas said, another example of interoperability is the COVID certificates because we, I can actually can travel across Europe with their digital uh, COVID cert vaccination certificate in my, in my phone and across borders, across countries, I can show it and, and actually use the same database of vaccinated people. But, though, but I agree with Thomas too, because this, there's not so many examples of this. Uh, things well, um, and uh, what we uh, faced here in Ukraine, uh, basically their older population, uh, they not able to kind of use this, and don't they don't they they scared, and sometimes they just don't feel included, uh, and uh, and sometimes it's a matter of infrastructure, but in most cases they just don't know how to operate. So, um, uh, and, and by the way, we we introduced the, the separate initiative. Uh, of the Minister of Digital Transformation to increase digital literacy in Ukraine to teach two million people digital skills and there, there, there's a there's a whole bunch of uh, different uh, actions that we do in order to make all these people included. So I think uh, uh, as a reflection of this report, I see that that's the uh, well that's a major concern, major reason behind of this divide. So people. Uh, it's actually a lot of things happening. Like um, uh, I can go on with their recent digital uh, initiative that, and, and, and uh, success in, in different fields. Like we completely redesigned and refactored uh, the way um, uh, mother, uh, young families and, and mothers uh, register their the newborns because there's, there's no need to go anywhere else. Just uh, all make online. The, we also introduced a fully online um, process of changing your residence I mean, I mean, the place, the place of where you live, and many, many others. Many, many other things. Personally, I'm not caring for like almost two years. I'm not carrying any driver license or any paper with me because it's all on my smartphone. But still, there's a, there's a problem for for for, for different group of people. So. Um, um, and the last thing I want to just mention that uh, we uh, started like really ramping up with the digitalization right before COVID. And uh, when it hit us, there was a, there was a really, like, in, like Thomas said in Estonia, they did it a long time before, so they were not affected, but we were really affected with that. But um, maybe it's uh, wrong to say, but uh, uh, help with, due to COVID, with those changes, uh, um, were made really like faster, really rapidly. Uh, and this is probably a good thing. There's a good outcome from the, the epidemic pandemic. Yeah, so that would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre, for, for this view from the ground, right, about the real obstacles you are facing in your day-to-day -day work. So Thomas, what's the secret? Why did the process succeed in Estonia. How come Estonia has is topping the charts when it comes to fintech, when it comes to early entrepreneurial spirit? What advice would you give Alexandre? Political will. Political will. I mean, you have to have a uh, government that is committed to this and is willing to go ahead and do it. Uh, and that's what we had. We had a series of governments that uh, different parties, but they were all committed to this idea of making it work. But since, uh, just to answer your question before, I have no argument whatsoever with with Dara, none, because I spent four years living in Palo Alto, where I, in a 
12 kilometer radius. I had the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, YouTube. When I wanted to register my daughter to go to school there, I had to drive to the headquarters. I had to bring my electricity bill, my visa, my DS 2019 form, which says I was a professor and I could work there. And then the person went and made photocopies of them all and then copied them down the data by hand. This is the world center of IT, but public services are non-existent. So, I mean, my, what I'm trying to say is that the public service part, that's what serves the people, not these companies. I have lots and lots of problems with the way the, the big tech companies work, but that's a completely different problem from actually a government stepping in and creating the, the ecosystem that would allow for public services, but also once you have created the unique digital identity for every person with a strong security element, you actually beef up the security of the a private sector because they're using ridiculously low levels of security. If you're going to, yeah, I mean, let's put this way, a, a, an email address and a single password gives you no security whatsoever. That's so easily hackable, it's ridiculous. So in fact, what you want to do is you, where I see the big problem uh, is that we're all wowed by, oh, and here's a new product from Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon. But in fact, the public sector is as backward in the United States today, I found out from experience, as it, I mean, it's, it's in the 1950s. That's when you had to go take an electricity bill or in the UK, a gas bill to say, see, I live here. I mean, this is, this is really sort of, it's 50, 60 year old technology. The only thing that was new when I went to the Palo Alto School District headquarters was, the, uh, uh, that, was that they had a photocopy machine. In the 1950s, they didn't have a photocopy machine. That's it. So I'm saying that the effort must be made on the, on the government side. And this is what Ukraine is doing right and this is what much of europe i mean the the this is where germany is probably way 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 behind and so i mean so this is where you actually where governments need to put in the political will and the money to digitize public services Thomas, you mentioned political will so i am not going to let you off the hook so easily so how do you get people to embrace e-government? Do you, how do you nudge them? Do you give incentives? Do you force them? Did you come across resistance when you were digitalizing Estonia? Actually, not very much. Um, to convince governments, you, I mean, we calculate in terms of uh, time saved in work, both on the supply and demand side, that is on the government side, but also the the public, the citizen, that we, we basically save about 2% of GDP a year in terms of how easily things can be done and time spent on all kinds of ridiculous things. One key to this is that when you digitize, you, you, per, you create a complete transformation of bureaucracy as it's been since it was invented, I don't know, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, with which is that government becomes a, I mean, all of public services are pursued in a parallel fashion. All of bureaucracy for 5,000 years has been a serial or sequential policy. You go, I mean, process, you go and you hand in a paper or a clay tablet in Mesopotamia, and then it goes to another office, and then it goes to another office. The revolution comes from actually making, create, all of these things happen at once. So when a child in Estonia is born, there's only one action, which is the hospital asks, what's the child's name? The child informs the population registry. The population registry informs the whoever does the birth certificate, the health insurance, the, 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 the local government you live in that then sends you a you know, package of candies or flowers to the mother. 
All of these things happen with no no action on the part of the citizen, other than saying the name is this. So these are, these are, I mean, we have the possibility, well, that's one side. The other side, which I just wanna mention before you cut me off, is that Estonia uh, is not only less corrupt than any other post commie country, we're less corrupt than a majority of the EU countries. And mainly this is, in, in, this comes to petty corruption because you no longer have, to, I mean, you when you automatize these processes, you do not have to pay a civil servant to perform a non-discretionary decision. You, I mean, you, re, you go see, you register to see the doctor. You don't pay anyone to see the doctor. You, I mean, whatever it is that you want, you do it online and it's, there's a computer that says, okay, you're this, or for example, even more complex things. You have, you're, you're a single mother with three children living with a low income. So you, you know, the figures, the data are all there. You just say, I would like to get assistance. And you get assistance because we know how much you make from the tax authority. And we know you have three ch underage children and we know that you're a single mother. And then the algorithm goes to work and says, okay, you get this many euros a month additional. So that's a welfare system works efficiently and you don't have to pay anyone off, you know, it's, there's no lines. So this is what say governments save lots of money by doing this. I love the idea of a non-sequential system. Now, just a reminder to our viewers to put comments in chat. If you're on Zoom, please introduce yourself when you do so. And on YouTube Live, please put them also into the comment box. Now, uh, so, say that, so therefore, I have no problem with the regulating big tech countries, the companies, none. We will come back to the issue of regulation, but now if I may ask Dina for her private sector perspective. Now, we've documented in the report uh, what Oleksand talked about, low level of skills, particularly among older workers in our countries of operations. Is this just a problem that's limited to emerging markets or is this something that you've come across in your professional career? Yeah, Beata, it uh, links up very closely also to the challenges of digital transformation in companies. And I think the, the biggest challenge is uh, people at many levels. One is having the people inside the company with the skills, having the, the uh, ability to translate uh, customer requirements, customer needs. Um, these skills are always uh, in high demand, um, but also it's uh, having the um, culture that goes around that, that encourages the continuous learning and upgrading of the skills. Now, of course, in, in Europe, the, that bond between companies and employee of secure employment, lifelong secure employment was broken some time back. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on people taking responsibility for their own capabilities and upgrading. But nevertheless, the jump, the leap has been quite huge and um, companies have had to invest in their people in order to make sure that uh, they could uh, participate in this journey. But it has been a big challenge. Um, we also see it, I know you're in asking about the employment side, but we also see it on the customer side. Uh, very easy to alienate um, whole rafts of customer segments um, because particularly when, you're when your driver is digitalizing for your own, uh, your own business processes, um, this can come at the cost. I mean, I remember personally the first time I went into a supermarket and was um, shown the 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 uh, to, you know the self service checkout, and I remember thinking to myself, if I wanted to be a checkout person, I would have applied for a job, I wouldn't have gone shopping. But of course, we've moved on along and we've learned those skills, but we we do have the risk of alienating um, many different segments. Thank you. You raised the issue of investment in workers. Um, but Alexandre, you, you were also active in business before you joined the government. I think in a country like Ukraine, an employer has a big dilemma because if you invest in training of a worker, um, then this worker 
may have a good chance of, of going abroad, of emigrating in the search of a bigger salary, and then your investment is gone. Do you think this is actually preventing firms from making investments? Well, I don't think so. I mean, there's a, there's a famous saying that when the, uh, let's say CFO came to the CEO and said like, listen, uh, teaching people gonna cost us a fortune and uh, uh, what are we gonna do is we, can, we can't afford it. So he responded back. So, uh, so you know, there was, so he said, they, they, uh, maybe just let them leave or just let's skip the salary on the same level. And he responded back with saying like, let's imagine we don't teach them and they stay, what's gonna happen? So you, you teach people anyway. And if you're, uh, if you're, because I'm a founder of really like a couple IT companies, and uh, we never thought this way. So we were always uh, trying to get the best of the people and get, give them uh, <clears throat> everything they need because we wanted to make uh, our products and our com company successful. And um, as, as, of the, uh, as of their immigration um, rate, so there was a, a huge immigration wave during uh, 15, 2014, 2015, when people were leaving because of the war with Russia started, when the war with Russia started, there was actual like um, combat uh, on the East, uh, but then uh, it stopped. And now, um, well, I think it's less than 2%. So basically uh, we've, we see what we see, uh, and because of the also right now I'm the representative of the body of regulating body of IT industry and I see a lot of initiative to, to, to teach people to teach people um, to uh, make them smarter, uh, give them additional way to uh, uh, realize themselves. So um, I would say that in uh, in IT industry, I'm not saying for all the industries in IT industry it's 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 like a common routine. So when you enter a company, you have your performance evaluation each six months, and then uh, you go uh, under like you're under surveillance of the supervisor. So you have to uh, improve yourself. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're not going to reach like you know, you're not going to be a part of the team, like really part of the team. Thank you very much. So that's hopeful that we see investment in workers. Now, Darren, if I may now move to you and if we could think about broader trends. Now, you documented the impact of increased robotization um, or industrial robots on employment. So, and presumably that has bigger potential employment effect than AI automation, but AI automation seems to be progressing faster. So which of these two trends will hit employment faster? And do you think um, that AI automation will be a net creator or a net destroyer of jobs? I think we don't know at the moment. And there's a very good reason why we don't know exactly. And it is because when you look at industrial robots, from the very beginning, they were designed as automation technologies. You know, from the get-go, and if you look at the academic articles in the 1970s and 1980s, it was very clear that what they wanted to do was to find ways, mechanical ways of replicating some physical tasks. AI is a much broader technological platform. It has the capacity to augment human capabilities, create a range of new tasks. But on the other hand, it can also be used quite effectively for automation. Now, if it is used for automation, it could be much more consequential than robots. In the United States, you know, it's about 5% of the workforce in blue collar occupations that can be directly impacted by industrial robots. Whereas, you know, 70% of the occupation in the United States have some components that are repetitive, but cognitive office work based or based with very simple sort of interactions. And in, in principle, it could be affected by AI-based automation. Now, the bad news in my own mind is that right now, AI is being completely 
forced into an automation path because it is dominated by the same companies that we were talking about a second ago, the big tech companies. If you look at the United States, about one out of three, four dollars that are spent on AI comes from a handful of companies, these companies that we talked about. And even beyond those, those firms' direct spending, they shape the direction of AI research. And their approach is very much based on automation. In fact, it's the sort of the defining characteristics of almost all of these Silicon Valley companies that they see humans as troublesome, fallible, uninteresting creatures, and somehow have a view that machines are much better than humans and should be, uh, you should use machines and algorithms whenever you can. In fact, if you see, look at Google, for example, today it is much bigger as a fraction of GDP than GM was, but employs less than one-tenth of the number of employees that GM did. And that is just a little symbol of how targeted and biased towards automation these companies are. But it's actually even worse than that. It's not just that we have the imprint of these companies on the direction of AI, but actually the reason why I think things are worse for workers, and in fact, worse for the economy, is that the vision of AI that has emerged from the recent sort of investments is actually a very distorted vision. If you look at the pioneers of machine intelligence, people like Wiener, Engelbart, Licklider, many of them early on thought of machine intelligence as a complement to human capabilities. Instead of that, we have gone down a sort of a distorted, strange path of Turing test-like reasoning, or actually bastardized Turing test reasoning that machines have to be better than humans. But actually, it's not really machines being better than humans. And if you look at most IO algorithms, they're actually pretty stupid. But it's finding very, very narrow tasks in which you can monitor and do replace humans, but not in a very, very productive way. So most AI algorithms are actually not adding much productivity growth to firms. So we have a double whammy. You have the automation based on AI and you're not, you don't really have the productivity benefits that you know, are sort of implicit or promised by these technologists and firms. So you have the worst of all worlds. And I think unless we do a significant redirection of technological change, in my mind, it's really doom and gloom for workers. So are you saying that there is too much automation or is it that it's directed for, to a wrong purpose? Well, I'm saying there is too much automation and it's bad automation. So in other words, you know, if you look at human history over the last 300 years, there has been a lot of automation. We're not in a unique period of automation. The British Industrial Revolution started with automation of textile manufacturing. The American system of manufacturing was a first step towards automation in, in factories. The mechanization of agriculture. All of these were rapid processes of automation. But automation uh, creates always distributional effects. So you need to deal with these distributional effects. Some of the ways that you deal with them is by creating new tasks, new opportunities. And then the other way that you actually benefit from automation is that if it's actually very productive. So when you mechanize agriculture, you really introduce the productivity of agriculture greatly. So today we have the worst of all worlds in the sense that we have a lot of emphasis, excessive automation, and the automation that comes out of it is pretty crummy. It's not even productive. So what do we do about it? What's the well, I think I think what we did in the past when we mechanized agriculture, and US is very interesting because it's actually, for example, relative to many European countries, it was an even faster process of mechanization of agriculture. If you all you did was mechanization of agriculture, even with the higher productivity than uh, we observe today in that automation process, it would have been a terrible process. So what we did is that in the, in the same, uh, at the same time, we also generated lots of new industries, lots of new jobs, lots of new tasks on, on factory floors in the non-manufacturing uh, non service sector. So that's what we're not doing right now. And, you know, frankly, of course, you need to rely on the market to do it. Governments are not the agents that are going to be the innovative agents. But when the market's not doing it by itself, 
because it's dominated by a few firms or it has sort of lost its uh, sort of purpose in trying to work with the workers rather than replace the workers, I think government intervention is necessary. So when I actually mention regulation of these tech companies, I don't just mean their use of data and violations of privacy and market power, but I really mean also what they are doing to the direction of future technology, how they are shaping the future possibilities for workers and consumers in, 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 in the Western world and beyond, actually. Thank you, Darren. So, so Thomas, perhaps I could get your reaction. How do we get big tech to behave better and not just uh, stop abusing power and misusing data, but how do we get them to direct innovation into a way that, into a direction that would be more beneficial for the society? Is it possible even? I'm dubious. <laughs> Uh, I mean, their their interest is uh, is profit, and uh, what is uh, societally beneficial is not necessarily uh, profit making, and so there's the incentives are fairly weak. What I again I I see a much uh, here government government should play a much greater role. I mean, we were talking before about the digital divide. I mean, in fact, what we have done is invested a huge amount into education in IT. And this also, when you raise the issue of people moving abroad, we actually, I mean, Estonia, like most former commie countries, uh, had a huge brain drain until the last five, six years. And in fact, right now, in and out migration is more or less, the saldo is zero. I mean, uh, people go out, but they come back. And this is a, a big difference. But then again, it has to do with the, with, uh, the intervening years rise in, um, rise in GDP per capita. So if you're no longer a poor country, then people, uh, the, I mean, all, you know, uh, all things being equal, then you'd rather, I mean, if you're gonna make the same amount of money or at least in terms of uh, PPP at home, well, I mean, that's where your family is, that's where your friends are. And so you find that people come back, uh, even if they go abroad to work or if they, or we find that people who go abroad to study will come back and not use the opportunity to stay. So, I mean, I, this requires, uh, I mean, the, you need a combination of things here. I mean, you need to have, you need to have a domestic tech industry. You need to supply that domestic tech industry with qualified workers. And for that, you need to put a lot of investment uh, into educating people uh, in these jobs. Uh, I mean, for 10 years, I went around telling people, you know, like, don't, you know, don't do these soft jobs, go, you know, study STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, because, and, and you can look around, look at the guys who, who studied STEM, they're making five times the, uh, the average income. Uh, I mean, so if you want to make more money, learn, st learn STEM and go into tech. And that's what has basically has happened in this country. And every country will have a We'll have a tech, uh, a qualified people tech deficit, and not everyone has to be a great, you know, inventor. I mean, it, data and analysis uh, is not a. I mean, you can basically teach this. You can. That's a high school skill if you actually teach it in high school. So I mean, we have to rethink our education policy because this digitization is going to happen. And it's just going to happen either at home or it's going to go, I mean, people go where the jobs are. And if it's going to happen in other countries, they'll move there. And I think the task of Eastern Europe uh, should be to, uh, to invest much more heavily in digital education so you develop the skills. Maybe some people will leave. On the other hand, it, I mean, you will also get domestic industries, domestic companies that will do well and will hire. And of course, uh, I mean, when you digitize public services, you also, I mean, you, you actually make life better for people. So, I mean, I'm obviously I'm like in a very optimistic mood, but on the other hand, we, it worked in my, worked in my countries, it's worked in other countries. 
Certainly, Finland is an example now of a rich country, but that pulled itself up through tech. So I would say, you know, uh, I mean, it, it really would pay for the EBRD to invest in programs that develop a domestic, uh, educated, uh, digitally educated uh, population. Thank you, Thomas. Great to see that we have an optimist and uh, pessimist. Now, Dina, let me throw a challenge at you. It seems an inevitable that we will move towards digital or smart infrastructure, right? That we will use uh, digitalization to control utilities, to improve the way public transport is run, um, to improve the way water supply is run. But this will mean exposure to cyber risks. How should we think about balancing the benefits and exposure to cyber risk? Is this, is data safety, is uh, exposure to cyber attacks um, something that concerns you very much? Yeah, I, I think uh, um, yeah, your report touched on that as well, Beata. I think uh, to ignore cyber attacks uh, or the, uh, the, the, and the investment needed in security, uh, would be uh, behoofs us all. Uh, I think Thomas already mentioned that uh, uh, the email address and password is nowhere near sufficient. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about barriers uh, and skills, uh, areas like cybersecurity are going to be a huge differentiator uh, and a huge challenge for different economies. Um, we had in Europe today, Media Markt was uh, is under an attack since Monday. Um, I cannot overestimate uh, and uh, over uh, advise on, uh, on paying attention to this. Um, I do want to say, add one other thing, Beata, if I can, to the previous conversation. You know, uh, I, I've actually implemented 10,000 robots in the last 10, 15 years in different tasks um, across uh, the companies I've been working with. And often we, you know, we've done this not so much to replace a human, but um, repetitive reconciliation type, not so not industrial robots, but uh, more office type work. Uh, it does, uh, it creates its own set of problems. Um, including security. How do you not forget about these robots? How do you know their identities? How do you control their access to different systems? Um, how do you update them? Uh, so it's not always, uh, uh, you know, the, you, they bring, automation brings its own challenges and it's not always about replacing people but augmenting the jobs, um, but it's not always easy to, to deliver that. Um, again, security is a very big issue in that field because of how do you control secure access um, to all these robots or these scripts that are running around your uh, infrastructure? Clearly a challenge. Thank you very much for bringing uh, this up, D uh, Dina. Um, Thomas wanted to come in, I bet, on the security, cybersecurity issue, please. Well, as the only country that's ever been shut down completely by the Russians in a cyber way, yes. Uh, but first, I want to react to something you said. What about the infrastructure side? I think we need to get beyond the, uh, the 20th century understanding of infrastructure. In the 21st century, your services are in a digital system. In the 21st century, your services are no less of a public services are no less of infrastructure than highways. I mean, you basically are, you have to deliver service, you have to guarantee they're secure. Interestingly enough, the security provided by a well-designed governmental system is much higher than the ridiculous secure non-security that we've seen in most recently in the various serious attacks on the United States where private companies skimp on security. There are no requirements even. So if you look at the, uh, the recent attacks that we saw either that, that shut down the oil uh, transport infrastructure in the United States, that's because these private companies invest as little as possible into the security elements of vital services that they deliver as private companies. 
And that it really comes down to, to insufficient regulation of their security elements. So we shouldn't, when we regulate tech or companies that use tech, we should not be merely looking at, oh, are they, you know, are they sending bad Facebook pages? That's, I'm not arguing that, but when, but we do not have the kind of necessary regulation on the quality of security that digitally based companies use. And this I think is another area where we really need to start focusing that, you know, we regulate companies that use digital. They're completely private. They make their money in the private sector. But when we see there how, how badly they're secured, how data goes out, how easy it is to compromise them, then again, we need to raise standards and impose standards uh, through government regulation. Thank you. I mean, that's a very valid point, right? Some minimum requirements imposed on companies. I mean, that also, we could also think about would there be a systemic risk if you think about limited number of cloud providers uh, that are used by banking sector? Is this something we should worry about as, as, as governments? Now, Alexandre, um, your country is thinking about digital currency. Um, what, where, where are you with that project? Are you very worried about the security aspect of it? What are the expected benefits? Uh, well, <laughs> we're not just thinking, we're actually doing it. So um, there was a pilot uh, less than two years ago when we tested, this is the for, for the first time. This year we implemented the a correspondent law that basically allow this uh, to make this project by National Bank of Ukraine. And um, right now we're, uh, well, we're soon launching a, sort of a sandbox for that. And we, we're gonna choose, uh, we're gonna start uh, different, choosing, uh, testing actually different platforms. Um, and then choosing the, 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 the best one in order to move part of the um, <clears throat> um, National Bank, uh, well, actually Grivna into the electronic form. So th this is uh, this, this being done uh, for a couple of months already. And uh, uh, next fall, this will be, they're going to be actual results. So we, it's, it's going to take time. Uh, what do we expect from this? Um, well, first of all, digital Grivna, this is how our currency called, uh, could minimize, minimize transaction costs for the state of the business. And uh, um, it, of course, it could increase transparency. But the major benefit that we see is a programmable money. So we actually can, will be able to do um, uh, different types of uh, um, like money that uh, we understand that is where, where they're coming from, where they go to. And this, uh, I can give you a couple examples. For for instance, uh, if it if it's a government money and use you use them for the construction purposes, and you um, uh, and you do different auctions and a bid to build the roads, and then you mark them, let's say with the with the green, and that means that all the money that goes for the production uh, purposes, I mean if, uh, construction purposes, they're going to be uh, they can be spent and spent only on. Uh, think related to construction. If we take money, uh, part of the money, and we want to do social uh, pay payouts or re 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 dis disperse, disperse money for social needs, then we can actually program them. So you can, uh, if you get those money, you can buy only food or, diff spe uh, or specific type of products. So you won't be able to spend them on let's let's say uh, like some casual things or or entertainment or any other stuff, and uh, we also can uh, can do program uh, like a smart contracts. So basically, if you uh, if you uh, interact with government and let's say you're uh, you want a, a bid uh, for um, I don't know for some service for the government, and then uh, there's no need for uh, for human interaction. Uh, in order to check out uh, what, what's being done or what's what's really done, and and uh, so this is going to be all uh, embedded in the code. 
So if the code executed, then uh, third party gets the money and, and government gets the service. So there's a lot of uh, examples of how this can eliminate a human factor, how it can uh, how it make a fully transparent uh, uh, environment. So digital uh, central bank digital currency is a really ne like next step ahead. Um, and uh, and there there are a couple other uh, benefits. Um, for instance, taxation could can could be automated fully. Like completely. So you, uh, if you if you issue digital grivna, and then some enterprise, is, and and then there's a transaction or like VAT a difference that this could be fully automated. Um, um, what else? Um, well, there, yeah, I can go on actually. So um, um, we are really, uh, as I mentioned before, we are really doing it and just following news and. Uh, I, I guess in the beginning of next year, we'll and we use it like Singapore as an example because they established, established some sort of a similar environment for that. They they created a sandbox with their couple of companies offering their technology, and we doing the same. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander. So you mentioned potential benefits, right? How, for instance, you could restrict the use of money so that it's used for the purpose for which it was distributed, right? And that brings us to the issue of, um, to the political dimension of, of this whole debate. Could AI pose a risk for democracies? Could it be abused to entrench autocratic regimes? So think about facial recognition. Darren, do you have a view on that? Well, you would not be surprised to hear that I am worried indeed about that. But I think I don't think it's futuristic. It's already there. You know, I think uh, data are going to be extensively used in structuring communication and political discourse. I think we're seeing only the tip of the iceberg with Facebook, Twitter, uh, Parler, etc. Platforms are going to have a lot of influence in how direct the nature of political discourse. So far, I think it has had pretty bad effects, not hugely extensive yet. I think we are very much at the beginning. But the second is the monitoring of citizens by governments. And we're seeing that in China. I think it's been now about 10 years since Chinese uh, authorities are very effectively monitoring speech on social media platforms and uh, very smartly censoring internet access to selected sites. But we're also seeing prototypes of the social credit system at the regional government levels and use of facial recognition cameras in Xinjiang and, uh, and, and, and parts of Beijing as well. Now, People might say that's a problem of autocratic governments such as Iran, Russia, and China, but I think that would be a little too optimistic. How can we make sure that once a democratic country or a democratic government, including the US, including Ukraine, including Estonia, has so much control over individuals that they're not gonna start misusing that power? I view privacy as a guarantee for both the functioning of the market system, but also functioning of the political system. Of course, I think it's great for the government to offer better services. So I am completely with Thomas on thinking that digital technologies have a lot of very profitable, beneficial applications in the government sector. And of course, it's great that governments can monitor some illegal activities that are very dangerous. But it is also, I think, worrying when everything that an individual does can be kept track of because of digital currency and other types of government data collection and data monitoring. And the disappearance of that private sphere, I think, will be ultimately very dangerous for democratic governance, whoever is in charge of that data. Thank you, Darren. And that actually is a good segue into some of the questions we've received uh, from the audience. Um, so there are a few questions about data. Um, um, so for instance, 
yes, we talked about abuse of data by data access by big tech, but what about small firms? Um, you know, if we restrict the access to data too much, will it disadvantage small firms and limit the number of startups we have? And so how do we find this fine balance? And second, um, someone is wondering about regulation of big tech. Um, developed countries, EU, UK are talking and doing something in this respect. What should be the position of EBRD countries, so of emerging markets? I don't know. Who, oh, Darren, would you would like to? Yeah, push? I, 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 had, I have just spoken, but uh, I think uh, that that's an excellent question about how to regulate data. And I think the concern uh, raised by the question is a real one. Uh, I view, for example, Europe's GDPR regulation as a very well-meaning and very symbolically important step. But the evidence is that it has actually not been super effective and it may have actually backfired. The costs of comp complying with GDPR are higher for small companies. And also some of the uh, effective implementation of GDPR has actually empowered big companies more because essentially what GDPR is a recent research paper that shows what GDPR has allowed the more security conscious consumers to opt out. So leaving a more vulnerable population in the hands of companies that collect data for manipulating them or are targeting ads to them. So therefore, I think the devil's in the detail when it comes to regulation. And I think the two basic ideas that we have to really think about are interoperability. I think increasing interoperability so that data doesn't remain the monopoly of a single company uh, would definitely, I think, go in the right direction. And the second is more of exactly what Thomas said in one of his comments is, you know, thinking of data as a public utility. So in the same way that, you know, public utilities have to be regulated quite tightly, including what you can do with the pipelines and how you give access to others. I think that's very important. You know, one of the things that really turned the corner, turned the sort of debate around during the Gilded Age uh, uh, antitrust was Standard Oil's use of pipelines as a way of monetizing its monopoly. So when other sh companies shipped oil, Standard Oil taxed pipelines uh, sending oil for, from other companies. And that was a turning point for the authorities to realize that really this is, this is something wrong here. Well, you know, the data economy is exactly based on uh, taxing other companies' usage. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, again, thinking of this, both the interoperability and the public utility aspects is going to take us, I think, closer to thinking about how we can make this work for people, not in the hands of a few players. Thank you very much, Darren. Anyone else who would like to come on finding this fine balance between Thomas's vision of traveling from Tallinn to Greece and using the same prescription and feeling having the same data standard, right? Versus the cost we impose on small firms, Thomas. First of all, I, say I agree completely. I mean, this is one of our Estonia's big objections as a small country with small companies to, uh, to GDPR not taking into account the, uh, the small firms with inordinate and disproportionate costs uh, that it really, it's, it turns out to be a benefit to the big companies. Uh, and uh, but that continues to be a big concern. I'm, I'm interested. Happy to find out there's a paper on this finally, because the, otherwise you just said, oh, you're just paranoid. But in fact, uh, well, I'll try to find it. Uh, one, we, one mechanism that we use uh, that, uh, that, but it requires, you have to have a strong democratic government is, is mutual and reciprocal transparency. I can see who's looking at my data. Uh, I mean, that's, that's something, for example, we're very transparent anyway, but I have uh, I mean, property records are open in, I mean, they're public access. Uh, if I, uh, and so I'll be, when I was in office, everyone is always looking to see what property I have. 
but then they forgot to know, they forgot to know that I can go and see who's been looking at my data. So I know that you know the yellow newspapers, like every couple of weeks, would you know I guess they went through all public officials, right? Uh, more importantly, I mean, on, on, uh, you can, I mean, you can increase your security by having these, by logging all transactions. Um, and this is what I usually say when people say, what about privacy is when uh, Michael Schumacher had a horrible accident uh, within uh, this racing car driver, he had a ski accident. Within hours, all of his medical data, his, his x-rays were in Bild Zeitung, the largest yellow newspaper in Europe. That could never happen with his data if he had been sick in Estonia, because I mean, you know, who you have the logs, and so you know who's like gone and you know taken the data. Whereas if it's if it's on paper, you just take a piece of paper, make a photocopy, put it back. I mean, we have to build in these these mechanisms to to preserve uh, citizens' privacy. Clearly, I mean, I don't say that it's everything. That's not good enough. But the point is that you have to also build the system as being at least having minimally logs of everything, mutual and reciprocal transparency. Um, and of course, and also very strong laws that, uh, that the government cannot override without a court order uh, that by, I mean, a court order will allow the government to go and look at something. Even there, there are things, we do not have any back doors on encrypted um, encrypted uh, communications, uh, which we also have encrypted uh, communications. So there's access to final databases, but encrypted encrypted messages are not, there's no way you can look at them. So, which I know because I asked with, when we, we had a terrible murder and I said, you mean you can't look at it? They said, nope. Um, so I, I'm saying that you have to build those things in if you want a democratic society. And that's something which obviously in countries like China is not really working too well these days. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think this is a great parting message for our countries of operations. We are almost at the end of our time. So Darren, what's one message you would like to leave our colleagues with? I think the most important message is actually for the public. I think uh, institutions such as EBRD would work, would be much more productive when they work with the public. And the most important for the message for the public is that I think the direction of future technologies is not something just to be left in the hands of self-proclaimed uh, men of genius, often men of genius, not enough women of genius in there. So I think uh, it is important to have input from the public about what these companies and their leaders are doing with the technologies, with the data. Thank you. Alexandre, what's your message? Well, uh, I, I would like to remind you that technology is just a tool. And this is, this is important how we use it and how we perceive it and how in everyday life we uh, help each other. And uh, there's, a, there's a number of ways to, to be helpful and uh, cooperate. So just remember that the technology is not solving everything. We're solving everything. Thank you, Alexand. And Dina, your parting words? Yeah, I think uh, I would say that uh, the discussion about whether in firms or governments or with the public, the question of ethics and uh, uh, integrity, particularly as it pertains to data and uh, access and ownership, you cannot have one discussion uh, about digitalization without having that discussion openly as well. Just as much in the private sector as And thank you, Dina. And final words from Thomas. Uh, countries and governments should realize that the, uh, that the 20th century uh, production methods will not guarantee being the best and richest countries anymore. I think Germany is a perfect example of that. That, that countries that digitize will move ahead and countries that like the United States and like Germany that rely on sort of their dominance in old technologies, particularly in the operation of government will fall behind and sort of relations will change. I mean, who would have ever predicted 
former Soviet Republic of Estonia 30 years later would be richer than Spain and will, I mean, per capita, and within an, a quarter will two or two will be at the level of founding EU member Italy. You wouldn't have never predicted that. And this is one reason why I always get upset about all of this smug uh, uh, air of superiority by old members of the EU toward the new members of the EU, even though it's almost 18 years since we joined. Well, Estonian example is a great example to follow. Dina, Darren, Alexand, Thomas, thank you very much for a very rich discussion. Thank you to our audience for being part of this event. We will be posting a podcast of our conversation and you can download it on iTunes. Please help us by reviewing and rating it so that others can find it as well. I'm Biata Javorczyk, looking forward to the next discussion. Stay safe and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.